Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame Museum, located at Sweetly Reserve Visitor Center um, in Stevens Point. And uh, this is our entranceway, which was created a few years back, um, meticulously carved by some of our work study college students and volunteers um, at the University of Stevens Point. All of this was done by student work. Um, you can see some of the details of the Native American person here, and some of the animals, the squirrel, and uh, the woodpecker here. But we refer to Wisconsin as a land of wealth, and it was a land of wealth, and still is. And the reason it still is, is because of our progressive and visionary um, conservation legislation that um, has gone on through the years. This is due to many factors, which the museum actually explores, looking at some of the reasons why we are at this juncture in conservation here in Wisconsin and how we got there. visitor enters the Hall of Fame Museum, you enter into the environment of pre-settlement Wisconsin, an environment where um, it was full of large white pine trees and lots of wildlife and clean flowing streams and the Native Americans living here, such as the Menominee and the Ash uh, Ashinaabe, Chippewa, the Fox, and some, several other tribes. And uh, a lot of people think that Wisconsin at this time was, I guess you could say, termed pristine. But it wasn't. Um, it was a land that was being used by the Native peoples. They were using the resources. They were um, exploiting the land. But in more of a balance, a sense of balance, in that the land was intricately involved or tied to their religion, and their perspective on life, and um, so they treated it fairly reverently. As well, um, there was a lot less population pressure on the environment of Wisconsin at that time. If you were traveling back in time to that, to that period, you would easily come upon maybe a wolf, a uh, gray wolf, timber wolf we call them, Scanning the forest floor, the understory of these pine, great pines, looking for prey. Uh, some of his prey can, would be chipmunks, uh, snowshoe hares, white-tailed deer. The trees, the white pines that you see in this diorama, and all the plants that you see in this diorama were created again by the students, all made from hand these towering white pines, which during this period of Wisconsin's history probably on average stood about 200 to 250 feet tall, with uh, diameters easily going to six feet, seven feet in diameter. We cast these our, ourselves from plastic or rubber molds that we made from actual white pines, and then cast these using a, a fiberglass resin. Upon entering this, um, a Native American voice will come on that will be sensory activated that will tell the visitor about the environment, the pre-settled, pre-European environment of Wisconsin and how Native Americans interacted with the environment in ways that they used the resources. into the museum and interacts with the uh, pre-settlement era diorama, the sensory will automatically kick over to this area, which we move from pre-settlement Wisconsin to the era of settlement and logging, logging of the great pineries.
the pineries, uh, which didn't actually just consist of pine trees and coniferous trees, but a lot of it was mixed hardwoods and pines, actually covered about two-thirds of Wisconsin at that period. The trees were vast uh, behemoths, rising 200 to 250 feet high, um, with diameters, like I said, around six, can be six, seven feet in diameter, easily. Um, and at this time, the settlers were just taken aback by the wealth of timber resources they found in Wisconsin. And back in 1956, as an ex or 1856, as an example of their perspective on this resource, they, uh, Ben Eastman, who was a congressman of Wisconsin at that time, boasted to his other colleagues in, in the Congress in Washington, D.C., that Wisconsin had enough trees to, to supply the rest of the nation for all time to come. They thought that this resource could last almost indefinite, at least for a thousand years. Well, once um, speculators and um, entrepreneurs came up here, they started to see the wealth and the money that could be made. And they were soon followed by many people seeking their fortune in the North Woods. Lots of Im immigrants newly um, arrived to America and Wisconsin. Many New Englanders who decided to go west for various reasons, some because the resources in New England had pretty much been exhausted and they needed to keep moving west, uh, pressures on the land out east. So they came to Wisconsin to make money and to cut the timber. And uh, life was hard back then. Most of the timbering was done in, in the winter because that's when they could pull the tree, the big trees out of the forest on skids being pulled by big Belgian Shire horses and oxen. This was before the time of trains. And so they would work mostly in the winter, in the cold Wisconsin Northwoods winter. But they would also work in the summer. But again, they thought that this resource would last forever. But that at the rate of cutting that they were doing, the effects of this overexploitation of the timber resource started to be felt by the late 1800s. And you could essentially say that it was gone in a lifetime, which is the theme of this part of the museum. And we pan over into the results, the consequences of one destruction and, uh, I guess, speculation uh, about, and our, I guess our perceptions of natural resources at this time. What resulted from this uh, one-way mindset of resource exploitation was a sea of stump fields, dried up soil, slash piles, and darkened skies. As wildfires soon swept over the land due to the changes in climate the dryness of the area and all these slash piles. These wildfires caused vast destruction, devastation of the rest of the landscape and killed many people as they engulfed towns. The Pestigo Fire of 1876 was an example of a very devastating and deadly fire. Phillips Fire in 1884 was another one. Well, this this um, part of the museum is to try to get across to the um, visitor here the sense of desolation and that there's no one left after the landscape has been pillaged and raped by the um, lumbering. There was no reforestation going on at this time either. It was just cut and run because uh, the, the perspective at, at that time was as soon as you cut timber then you could use it for agriculture. And the theme was, going into our next part of the museum, is that the plow would follow the axe. All right, the visitor, upon leaving this exhibit and describing 
the um, effects of timbering, of uh, one perspective type of timbering, we move into some of the makeshift sawmills that started to pop up along the rivers, riverways and streams of Wisconsin to take care of all the logs that were floating down the rivers. Now, the ecological effects of the logs flowing down the rivers were quite devastating on the aquatic ecosystems and that there were just hundreds of thousands of logs moving down the rivers, dredging up the bottoms, uh, blocking all sunlight going into the rivers. Uh, many of the rivers were dynamited so that the logs could float down easily. Well, many of these sawmills that were popping up along the riverways eventually became the towns of Wisconsin, towns and cities that we know today. Stevens Point is one example. Stevens Point started out as a, a, um, a sawmill to take care of the, the logs that were moving down the Wisconsin River from farther up north. It was started by um, a man named George Stevens. He came from out east, I believe Vermont, and uh, sta started a sawmill in a place where it was used by tr traditionally by Native Americans to portage the Wisconsin River. But well, once the land was cut over, like I said, there was this belief that a land that was growing such large and abundant trees must be rich in nutrients and resources and moisture. It just must be a very fertile land. So the immediate goal was to settle the lands of Wisconsin, the cutover lands is what they called them, and settle it and have it farm. We were going to turn these vast areas of cutover northern Wisconsin land into big farms. And so there was an active uh, move by the state government of Wisconsin to get people to settle. And most of, the, most of their um, commitment or their action was trying to get Europeans, northern and southern um, Europeans, to come over here and settle Wisconsin, many of these being Scandinavians and Germans. Um, they would, there was a handbook that was published by uh, the department, or the, uh, actually University of Wisconsin, the um, agricultural department, along with the, gov the state government, called the um, Handbook for the Homesteader, which explained how fertile the land was, showed pictures of the produce that some of the early farmers were pulling off the land. And this diorama here will show um, one of these settlements, these uh, farmers in the cutover area with their immigrant farmers with their produce, which will be lined up on this bench. And coming over this way, the viewer will be able to look, interact with this exhibit and look in the windows and see pictures from this period in time of what the towns were like, what the, the um, topography was looking like in this time, what the farms were looking like, and so forth. Well, unfortunately for many of these farmers, um, they're a bit hoodwinked because the land, being mostly sandy, was uh, well, too well drained. It just did not hold water and it didn't hold minerals or nutrients that plants needed. It was pretty much a mineral soil. As well, it was far enough north that the growing season was way too short to be very productive farmers, especially in terms of growing vegetables, because it was just too high in latitude. So many of these farms went belly up by the uh, 1920s. They were tax delinquent, the people cannot pay their taxes, and they reverted back to the state of Wisconsin. And this kind of leads to um, the state forest reserves that we have now, because the state had all these tax delinquent lands that they were accumulating as people were going belly up, and they had to figure out what they were going to do with them. And they eventually led to the reforestation efforts that we'll talk about later. Well, from the exploitation of timber, we move into the first uh, moves. To, oh, let me back up a bit, sorry. Um, it's as far as we've gone so far, it's been pretty much just resource use. How can we best just most effective and efficient way to exploit the resources of Wisconsin? 
without any um, look at the consequences of our actions. But as we saw in the earlier exhibit, the fires, which were so devastating and, and destructive to the Wisconsin area and to actual people's lives, initiated the first inklings of a conservation philosophy. Um, and that was, they were starting to um, enact legislation to prevent forest fires. That was the first inkling toward conservation. Anyway, we move on to the second inklings of conservation, which began because of the raid on wildlife. And just, um, besides having a vast um, expanse of trees, of timber, Wisconsin skies were covered with just waves and waves of waterfowl and uh, passenger pigeons, which blocked out the sun. And this just, um, this vast resource, again, was seen as inexhaustible and introduced the era of market hunting. Hunters would kill as many waterfowl as they could to ship out east to the, to the markets of Chicago and New York. They would put them in barrels. They would just blast with these shotguns as many as they could. There was no quotas, no laws, and they would just fill up boats like these houseboats like this with their kills. And soon people started to see the effects of this overhunting. This was kind of this was called market hunting. And this is when some of the early conservation legislation toward the protection of wildlife was starting to be introduced. This is around the turn of the century. So as I was saying, there was a vast um, overexploitation of the wildlife, especially the birds and the waterfowl of Wisconsin, as well as the deer. The last um, elk was shot somewhere in the 1870s. The last moose was around that time. Um, there was bounties on wolves. Most predators were there was bounties on. Um, there weren't any hunting regulations, so. People were just taking as much as they want, and there was a lot of waste. Well, the effects of, of these practices soon became evident to many people in Wisconsin and alarmed them because they saw that a lot of their wildlife was disappearing. Hunters weren't being able to find game. So there was a move toward regulation of these market hunting practices. And, and you started to see restrictions um, passed through the state assembly and legislature, um, putting um, restrictions on times of uh, the season you could hunt, on the bag limits, and so forth. Well, to be able to enforce those, to have it on paper is one thing, to be able to enforce it is another. So the next obvious step was the um, establishment of the game warden system, protectors of these resources, and the law enforcement officers to um, back, it, back up the regulations that were now starting to appear on paper. Well, in this area here that will be coming over from the market hunting to here will be a diorama and text explaining uh, the whole market hunting period and some of the early restrictions that were starting to pop up in Wisconsin. And there were people starting to um, early on, realize some of these progressive thinkers that the Hall of Fame has been established to commemorate, um, who started to um, voice out their, their, what they were seeing and what they were thinking, and to try to be the, uh, the conscience of society. People like Increase Alan Lapham, back in the 1850s and 60s, who were speaking out against the wanton destruction of timber. And um, people like uh, Ernie Swift who became one of the first game wards. Anyway, so we move over here to this exhibit, this diagram, this part of the exhibit. And if you look up at our sign, the theme is law comes to the land. Because this was a lawless area, most of northern and central Wisconsin, around the turn of the century, there weren't many police officers or law enforcement officers, and there was no one to enforce some of these new game laws. So this, uh, the, game warden, the game wardens were established. 
And this diagram in here depicts the life of the game warden around the 1920s and 30s. This was a dangerous time to be a game warden because uh, Wisconsin was still a fairly wild place. And these game wardens would be out three to four weeks at a time out in the bush. This is an old Model A 1929 Ford pickup that um, we had donated that we will use as the game warden's truck. And they had trucks similar to this. And uh, they would have all their pelts, maybe the confiscated pelts that they would have would be in the back here as well as their tent and other supplies, food, fuel. And so we'll have that in here. The visitor will come and be invited to step into the game warden's truck and have a seat. Well, this game warden in this in this exhibit has, it's at night, has snuck up and surprised a poacher at his makeshift camp. And the poacher has run away, maybe with several poachers, but one of them is still looking through the window. And you can see some of the skins hanging down, and the fire is still burning. There's still a pot on the table. And they probably had a shotgun. Many game wardens were killed at this time trying to enforce these laws, and they were usually working by themselves. What will happen here is the visitor will step into the car, it will activate a sensor which will turn on the radio and the headlights will turn on, which will illuminate the poacher's camp. There will be things on the seat that a game warden at this time would have had, tins of food, maybe uh, his cigarettes, um, his lighter, um, other items that a game warden have at that time. The radio will, come, radio will then come on and with period music in the background explain the life of the game warden and why he was out there doing what he was doing, pre protecting the wildlife resources of the state and talking about how dangerous it was and the importance to the state and to conservation of our resources. Okay, just behind over here is going to be a timeline. This is very makeshift now, but a timeline which will describe from the beginning of man's history here in Wisconsin, early Native Americans about 10,000 years ago, to the present, all the events that uh, came about in resource use and exploitation and eventually conservation through the state's history. And there'll be interact this will be an interactive timeline with lots of little gadgets and artifacts and things that the visitor can interact with um, to learn about conservation and its time frame in Wisconsin. Okay. The last part of the um, museum that we have somewhat done right now um, we will move from the game warden era to some of the um, conservation actions that were occurring to try to reforest this uh, tax delinquent cut over land of northern Wisconsin. The Great Depression of 1929 actually ushered in many of the conservation practices and actions taken because of the make work programs, the New Deal programs of Roosevelt. And one of the such programs which Wisconsin benefited greatly from and which, whose legacy still carries on is the Civilian Conservation Corps that was created as part of the New Deal, which put to work many of the men in the nation who were out of work because of the Depression and the economic circumstances. Um, right now we have kind of a mural showing these men replanting the forest. Eventually what we'll have here is a CCC bunkhouse, um, which would be typical of one found at a Civilian Conservation Corps camp somewhere in, uh, in Wisconsin. Most of them were in northern Wisconsin. And there will be two men, silhouettes of men, talking on the back porch of the bunkhouse. And a tape will go on and they will talk about their day's work, what life in a CCC camp was like, and so forth. And there'll be probably the footlockers here and uh, bunk beds. But some of the first 
actual work that the CCC was involved with wasn't with reforestation, but was actually, again, with forest fires. But once uh, they became, they started to diversify and become a coordinated effort, and um, they, uh, a lot of them began to focus on reforestation efforts across the state, trying to restore some of the timber heritage that was once Wisconsin's. So this has a long way to go. I'd like to reiterate that all of this, all of these exhibits are being done by UWSP students. And so we can only get really our work done during the school year. And it's all volunteer work and we're having to train many of the people. So it's a slow process, but eventually we will have it all together and it will be a nice museum to learn about Wisconsin's resource use and conservation heritage and legacy which we will move into the gallery of inductees in a minute. These are people in Wisconsin's history, the individuals who were visionary, who, were, who had foresight, who were bucking the system, who were radical in their thinking at the time, who actually contributed to changing the way that we use the resources and were instrumental in the the uh, inaction of conservation legislation. Welcome to the formal gallery of inductees into the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame. This is our room to um, commemorate and celebrate the conservation leaders of the state who have been visionary in their uh, accomplishments, actions, and thinking throughout Wisconsin's history and are, uh, have a legacy to carry forth. And this is why we are here, is to try to, um, to communicate this legacy to the future, present and future generations of Wisconsin citizens. People such as Owen Grammy, who was a wildlife painter one of the foremost wildlife painters in the United States, worked for the um, Milwaukee Public Museum, but was um, instrumental in several um, conservation battles, one of them being the Horicon uh, Marsh and the uh, hazing of the geese back in the 40s and 50s. Uh, he spoke through his art, Owen did. But um, basically educated people on the resources and the beauty of Wisconsin, especially its wildlife and its bird heritage. Other people, such as uh, Curly Radke, just an ordinary citizen from Horicon, who almost, uh, with, who's an Isaac Walton League member, who probably was the instrumental person in getting Horicon Marsh protected, restored, and saved. There are many, I, mean, I could go on forever about many of these people. They're just fascinating um, and unique individuals. And there's interconnections between almost all of them. They were friends, colleagues, um, they almost knew each other all throughout. Some of them, like Increase Alan Lapham, of course, were way early before many of them were even born. He was one of the first people to speak out. A self-trained scientist, never went to school, but um, was very well educated, self-educated uh, in the geology. He was Wisconsin's first state geologist. He was educated in botany. Um, he was part of the first forest commission, which um, was looking at the forest resources back in the 1860s. And they came out with a report entitled The Disastrous Effects of the rapid overcutting of timber in Wisconsin at this time. Well, there's many folks. In the end, we have John Muir and Alan Leopold, who are our first inductees. Um, this gallery is set up to commemorate these people, and eventually we will have exhibits that will allow visitors to interact and learn about each of the individuals. We, in we induct about two per year. The induction is in April. Um, some of our most recent inductees last year were the Hammerstroms, 
Fran and Frederick Thomas Strong, who did quite a bit of work um, on uh, the greater prairie chickens and the saving of the Buena Vista Marsh or their habitat. And Robert Ellison, who was a uh, wildlife ecologist from the University of Wisconsin Madison and was the um, uh, on the air, nature on the air personality in the 50s and 60s, teaching kids, especially rural school kids in Wisconsin, about Wisconsin's natural heritage. So that's about it. And uh, hopefully we will carry on and continue to work in trying to inform the public about these individuals and Wisconsin's conservation history and hopefully inspire them to carry on this legacy.